Welcome everyone. I want to thank you all for coming to our final fall distinguished lecture series. Um, again, this is our final lecture for this semester. We'll start again in January, actually February. We'll start again in February. Um, and we have some wonderful speakers signed up for next semester. But for now, I am delighted because we have the man, the myth, the legend, Garth Kuyper here with us. And so Garth is a cybersecurity professional in the industry, um, insurance industry, and he holds several certifications, of course, that are related to cybersecurity and systems administration. So he graduated right here, our very own department here at Southeastern. He's a Southeastern alum. He has a bachelor's degree in computer science, and he worked for the Office of Technology for uh, five years in systems engineering and information security. He'll tell us a little bit about that, I'm sure. And Garth has also been involved in multiple software startups um, and securing APIs and their underlying infrastructure and microservices across the cloud environment. So again, I know you guys are going to join me in welcoming Garth as he speaks on the components of enterprise cybersecurity. Thank you, Garth. Thank you. Yep, so I'm Garth. Um, so a little, little disclaimer, uh, this was prepared in a personal capacity, not in a professional capacity. Um, so these opinions are mine and they don't reflect the views of any current or previous employers, institutions, organizations that I may have been affiliated with. Um, speaking as myself, not as a spokesperson. All right, so who am I professionally? Um, like, like it was mentioned, uh, I graduated here with a bachelor's in computer science, uh, fairly recent grad, uh, graduated in 2019. Um, so I had a, an honors thesis. I got to pen test the ID cards at Southeastern um, and some of the user account systems. Uh, if you want some details about that and some of the interesting things, uh, talk to me afterwards. Um, so for my day job, I'm a lead cybersecurity engineer in the insurance slash healthcare industry. Um, and before that, I worked here at Southeastern as an information security specialist. So I've got a couple certs. Um, some are for cybersecurity stuff, some for like sysadmin stuff. Um, we're a big Microsoft shop where, where I work now, so I had to go pick up a ton of Azure stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I do ham radio too. All right, so the kind of like top roadmap here, I'm gonna explain like some stats and why security matters. I'm gonna give like an overview of some of the popular uh, cybersecurity frameworks. And then we're gonna talk about like some real world practical controls that you might see in an enterprise. All right, so some stats. Um, this is stuff I just pulled off of a website that kind of spoke to me. Um, so average cost of a ransomware recovery is two million. So that's it's getting really expensive now uh, when somebody comes in and destroys data and they have to recover from backup. Business might be down. So that's expensive. Um, some companies pay ransoms. Some can't. Some can't by law. Um, but the average ransomware payment last year was half a mil. The average time to identify a breach was 212 days. So think about that time when a, when a company gets exploited and an attacker makes it onto the network. They're there for a while. They're watching, they're learning. They're kind of, imagine if they're like a new employee in IT, they have to go learn the whole system before they really find out where the pain points are to strike. Um, and the next bullet point, a lot of employees have access to a lot of files. So access control is a big issue in a lot of industries. Um, there's some crazy stats. Average financial services employee has 11 million files they can touch on the first day that they go. So um, you can imagine why that might be an issue if somebody's account got compromised and they worked for that industry. Uh, a lot of data available to Xville. Um, and last two bullet points, this is a good prospective like job industry. So unemployment's about 0%. According to that site, um, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics says this is going to grow about 30% over the next decade. So very good field to be in. 
All right, so some popular frameworks. There's the NIST standard, so the National Institute. Um, there's two main frameworks that I've heard mentioned a lot. There's the actual cybersecurity framework, but there's also an incident response framework. So the cybersecurity one, that's covering more of the controls that you might implement to protect your enterprise. And the IR framework, that handles um, what you would do if somebody got in, if somebody compromised the system, how, how you should handle that. There's some good guidelines there. Um, there's also two ISO frameworks, very similar to the 853 NIST framework. And another one that's popular is the CIS controls framework. That's going to be the one I talk about, um, kind of go into a little bit of detail about some practical controls you might see in an environment. Um, these aren't to be confused with uh, baselines. So if you were like in an enterprise and they've got laptops and servers, you might have to adhere to like sys baseline to say, hey, we got to do this, this, and this to get a good sense of basic security. Um, there are baselines from NIST and CIS, and that's separate from the controls that they want you to implement. So if you look at the NIST framework, you'll see a lot of circles on Google Images, like the businessy type of graphs. They're like, yeah, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And so there's a lot of subcategories there. Um, and a lot of those overlap with all the frameworks. Same thing with ISO. Um, we've got a lot of domains here. This is just another image I pulled off Google. Things like access control, operational security, a lot of overlap between the frameworks. And this is the Sys one. Um, so they've got 18 domains. There's, there's kind of a lot. Um, and uh, they've got different levels of protection. So they've split them up into different implementation groups, um, which is kind of handy because if you're, if you're a new organization or maybe a small business or a smaller enterprise, and say your security program isn't in a great state or you think you could improve, the, the CIS uh, implementation guides are kind of handy because you can start out at implementation guide one and get some of the basics out of the way to get a good sense of general security. And then as you mature, you can start to go after the controls in category two and category three. All right, so diving right into it. This is the, the 18 domains. So the first one is maintaining control over your enterprise assets. So the very first one here, this is probably the most important one, in my opinion, out of like all 18 domains to make sure you have a good asset in inventory. So if you're trying to defend an enterprise and you don't know what you're defending, that's a problem. You need to know all the laptops that are out there, all the desktops. This can be a real challenge if you've got lots of departments or lots of places that can spend money and acquire technology. Knowing everything that exists in your enterprise can be a huge challenge sometimes. Um, so that's really important to know what you've got out there. Because then when it comes time to say, okay, is everything secured? You're able to know what everything is to be secured. Second bullet point, um, keeping up with unauthorized assets. So if you're in the DOD or in the government sector, um, there's certain vendors that you're not allowed to buy from, like Lenovo, for example. They have ties to China. So Lenovo laptops are a no-go in some industries. So you might have one department, they buy stuff and they're not super familiar with what's allowed and you might have some unauthorized stuff on your network. Um, third point, using an Active Directory tool. So this is referring to Microsoft Active Directory. So whenever you join computers to your Microsoft domain so that you can log in, um, that's a really good tool to keep up with your, uh, your asset inventory. So you can use Active Directory and see what, what is out there in terms of servers and laptops. Another point, um, for things that aren't Microsoft-y and you don't necessarily log into them all the time, you might look at your network logs, your DHCP. So 
whenever you connect to a network, you get an IP address to connect. Um, and that'll be in your DHCP logs. They'll say, hey, I handed out this IP to this computer. And looking at those logs will give you an idea of what's out there. So you can, from the request data, you can tell this is a Samsung phone, or this is a Lenovo laptop, or this is like a badge scanner on a door somewhere. Um, these logs are a great way to build up uh, visibility and some of the gaps that you might have. Um, and uh, the last one, using a passive asset discovery tool. So if you've ever taken uh, 408 or 409 here, um, you might use Nmap a lot to scan the network and see what you can find. So in the enterprise world, believe it or not, that's actually a good way to keep up with inventory on the network. Every once in a while, it's a good idea to scan the LAN and see what shows up. And if there's something there and say a department where you expect there just to be like worker desktops, and something new shows up, you might want to investigate that because maybe somebody bought a new computer. All right, so second domain, controlling your software assets. So we talked about hardware for the last domain. This is like the software side of it. Um, so it's a good idea to keep a list of all the software that you've got in your enterprise. Um, this matters more for some industries than others. So if you're in like a really secure environment, there might be certain programs you're not allowed to use. So I'll give you a, for instance, um, some people might like to use CC cleaner. It's like a popular tool, to like clean up some of your stuff on your computer. Um, that's linked to foreign countries. So some businesses might love using CC cleaner and then other more secure businesses, they might say, oh no, you absolutely can't download that. That's built by a, a foreign country. Um, so having a software inventory, knowing what's out there on your computers is really important. Um, if you have uh, licensing agreements that you have to maintain, that can be important for that reason too. So Microsoft um, may come audit you and say, well, you said you only installed this many Windows servers or this many Windows computers. If they come in and audit you and look and find that you have hundreds more computers than you said you paid for, then that could be an extra cost. They might charge you like list price for those licenses. Whereas if you'd kept an inventory and you'd bought them like, the normal way, you might've gotten a better deal for it. Um, a lot of companies will do that. Um, so good idea to keep track of what you've got out there. Second bullet point, make sure you're using su supported software. So this, this seems like common knowledge. Like a lot of these, a lot of these bullet points will, will seem basic. It will make sense. Um, but this has to be said, like make sure your browser is up to date. Like there are companies that might not do the best job and some things may slip through the cracks sometimes. So this actually has to be said to make sure your software is up to date and supported. Um, a lot of enterprises where they might buy an application and it might be critical to their business and it'll be used for a decade and they'll end support or the company will get bought or they'll go bankrupt. And now your business is relying on this software that you can't get support or updates from anymore. So it's a good idea to keep track of that so you can kind of stay ahead of the game. You know what your business needs to function and you're not caught off guard when that thing breaks, your business comes crawling to a halt. You go to call for help and you realize oh, that company doesn't even exist anymore. We're screwed. All right. So third point, address unauthorized software. So that kind of goes back to what's allowed and not allowed, like CC cleaner might not be allowed. Um, some, other, some other unauthorized software might be like Spotify, like. You, you might not be allowed to install stuff like that on a, a work computer. So that's for security to make sure if there's any vulnerabilities in those apps, we don't have to worry about that. The less apps we have, the better. So from a security standpoint, preventing unauthorized software from being installed is a big thing. The next point, keeping track of what you've got in an automated fashion. So um, there might be a couple ways of doing this. Like you might talk to 
whoever does purchasing or financials for your your company and say, okay, what have we bought that software wise? Like they'll they'll know what contracts you have and when stock comes up for renewable. So you'll have some idea of what you paid for, but that might not be the whole picture. There might be freeware software, um, tools like Putty, stuff that you might use to SSH into another uh, computer, um, web browsers. Um, so it's a good idea to have a scan running every once in a while to keep track and see well, what's out there, what's installed on these computers. We know what we want to be installed. Is that actually what's on these computers? And then these last three bullet points, um, they talk about allow listing. So there's, there's controls that you can put in place to prevent stuff from being installed. Um, so we can make sure you can only have Chrome and Microsoft Edge, but you can't install Firefox or any other apps that we don't explicitly say is allowed. Like you might have a lot of shareware or freeware tools that you want to use. You put those on the list, but if somebody goes and tries to download something new that they saw on a blog, that's not going to be allowed. Um, and from the, like the sysadmin side and the development side, same thing goes for libraries and scripts. So you might be developing software and there'll be libraries out there that you install with say Python or NPM. And it's really important to build up an inventory of those libraries and whether or not you want those to be allowed. Um, there's a lot of supply chain attacks nowadays where an attacker will take a really popular Python or node library. They'll clone it. They'll make everything look exactly the same. It'll have the same number of followers, same number of uh, stars on the GitHub project. And to you, this will look like a reputable library or package that you might want to use, but the name might be off. Like it might be the same package name, but with pi added to the end of it. Um, so there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of packages out there that are like kind of similarly named clones um, that have extra malicious code in them. Um, so that's a, that's a very prevalent risk right now um, where people are using these libraries in their projects and they're getting their API keys stolen essentially um, because this is already embedded in your code. It's taking your root credentials, your API creds and X filling them out to an attacker. Um, so library security is a huge thing in software development. And similar, similar thing for scripts. Um, when you're doing sysadmin work, there's tons of scripts out on GitHub that are gonna make your life a lot easier. Um, if you're trying to solve a problem, chances are somebody else has done it before. And not everything on GitHub, even though it's public out there, not everything is reviewed. So there's stuff out there that might look and work, um, but there might be extra hidden stuff in the code um, or that might be a malicious copy of the script that you thought you were running. All right, uh, data protection. So this will, this is probably important for every every company, um, but some more obvious than others. So you would think companies like banks, they would probably have a more heavy in, uh, interest in protecting your data, um, hospitals, things like that. You know, it's very obvious, like we don't want the healthcare information to get leaked, things like that. Um, so this can be obvious, uh, but in other industries that might not be quite as obvious, like a university, um, might not be on like the forefront of the mind when we're talking about things to protect. Um, but there are, there are rules and laws that you have to follow uh, in most industries. So even though it might not be intuitively obvious that data protection is a concern at a university, I mean, we've got rules like FERPA that protect student records. Um, so there can be implications, like if an attacker were to compromise a university and get all the data for all the classes all the students have ever taken, that's a really big deal. Um, there's financial implications if things like that were to happen, like it would cost a lot of money. Um, so even in industries where it might not be obvious, it's probably still extremely important. Um, so the first point here to set up a data 
management process. So you want to know all the kinds of data that you have. Are there any legal or regulatory requirements for protecting them? Um, some kinds of records, depending on what they are and like healthcare, there's a uh, breach notification requirements. So if certain kinds of records are leaked or stolen, um, your notification timeline might change. So you might only have 48 hours to like let the FBI know, otherwise you'd be in violation. Whereas in other industries, other kinds of data, the, the requirements for that are a little bit different. Um, so second, second bullet point, keeping track of everything that you've got, all the records, whether it's like employee information, all their social security numbers, their bank account information, because you have to direct deposit them money when you pay them. Um, all this is worth protecting for pretty much any organization. It just depends. Everybody's got a little bit different data. Um, third point, configuring your ACLs. So that's your access control list. Who's allowed to touch what? So HR people, they, they're the only people allowed to log into the HR system to get that pay stub information. Um, data is on a need to know basis. Whoever's supposed to touch the data, those people can touch it, but you can't have other departments getting access to the data. Seems like a basic thing, but data ACLs, not every corporation, not every organization has a perfect 100% handle on. There's always room to improve. Um, fourth point is data retention. So for small businesses, um, you might not have as big of a legal requirement for this in terms of what you're required to keep. Um, in other industries, like you know, for the university, I believe it's seven years, they have to keep data. Um, and the definition of what data they have to keep, that changes too. So it might not be every file, but it might be things like meeting notes or business documents. And the definition of a business document might be different depending on the industry. So there's like a legal aspect to that too in the kinds of data you're supposed to keep. Um, next point is making sure you securely dispose of data. That's a, that can be widely interpreted. So this might mean making sure you wipe a laptop before you sell it or throw it away, um, take out the hard drive and destroy it, um, things like that. Sixth data point, uh, encrypting data on user devices. So this, again, this really, really depends on the industry you're in. So in a university, it might not be absolutely critical to encrypt a uh, workstation. Um, but in like the banking industry, it would be important because you've got like financial access to records there. So like people's bank accounts, things like that. Um, so depends on the organization, depends on the industry, um, but always a good idea if you got it. Uh, a lot of modern laptops and computers now, they can do this and there's not really any hit to performance. It's built into the processor now. So you can encrypt it. It's not like it used to be where it would eat up like a 10th of your processing power. So there's not really any drawbacks, um, not any obvious drawbacks to encrypting data. It'll save you if a laptop got stolen or something like that. If somebody lost it in a, like the back of a taxi cab, you don't have to worry and say, what was on there? Um, are we obligated to report this? Did we get breached? Did we leak data because this laptop got lost? If it's encrypted, you're good. Um, seventh data point, classifying your data. So knowing what you've got and where you've got it. So we might say we've got like a giant network share, everybody uses it, um, but your financial folder, maybe only the financial department can access that. And that would be different records. That would be super secure, whereas say, uh, like the business department, they might have a folder, um, but maybe it's teaching material. Maybe it's stuff that's not as uh, critical if it were to get leaked. Um, so knowing where all your personal information is, knowing how sensitive it is, that's important um, because inevitably when a company is breached and you go through the logs and you say, all right, we saw they went in this folder and they went in this folder and this one, 
you have an idea now of what was lost. So it gives you a better understanding of what you have to report to like the FBI um, and some of the ramifications legally. And this is a, this is a big domain. Data protection is really big. Um, so 3.8 is documenting data flows. This is more of a thing in large organizations. So if you've got a manufacturer, let's say you work for Microsoft and you get tickets in, um, like help support tickets, knowing how that data flows through your system is important. You might have a really complex like call center process from when the tickets entered on the website, goes to this database to get stored. And then somebody in the call center from a laptop accesses it from there. And they might be required to say report that as like an operating system bug in Windows. They might have to go into this other database and go enter that there. So knowing how data can flow through your business is important. Um, in the insurance industry, like if you had a, a car claim, you went in a car crash and you submit that claim, that's going through a ton of different systems on the back end. Um, so it's really important to know where that sensitive information is being stored and where it's flowing through. Um, some enterprise systems, they could be really complex and a lot of departments may have an idea of where their piece of the data handles, but they might not have the whole complete picture. Um, so that can be a real challenge in large organizations. Next one, um, encrypting your thumb drives, your USBs. You don't want to store like your assignment information on USB and then like leave it in a lab and then have another student just be able to read it and like plagiarize your paper, your code. Um, encrypting thumb drives is a good idea. Uh, same, same principles apply in business. You're putting sensitive stuff on there and you lose it in a parking lot and it's encrypted, you're protected. You don't have to worry about it. Um, Encrypting data in transit, that's, that's things like transferring files over the network, um, going over the internet. If we've got cloud storage, making sure that's secure, um, making sure you have the right SSL certificate on your website when users are submitting information to your site. Um, that's sensitive data in transit. That's encrypting that. Um, encrypting sensitive data at rest that's when it's already on the server. So you've already submitted, say, your car crash claim, and you've already put all that information in the system. That's sitting on a computer somewhere on a hard drive um, until it's read and somebody acts on your claim. It's sitting there at rest. So it's important to encrypt that. Um, in a lot of enterprise environments, that happens automatically. Um, so you might have Microsoft BitLocker encrypting all of your server drives. Um, or in really large environments where you've got something like a NAS or a, a SAN and you have systems dedicated just to storage um, at the disk level, that might happen inherently. So you set up your virtual servers and they have storage, and, but the hard drive in the data center, that's encrypted. So you could rip it out, throw it in the trash and know that the data on that isn't at risk. Point 12, segmenting your processing and your storage based on sensitivity. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind with this is DOD. So if you've got like a top secret computer network and a different computer network that's just for secret information, you would wanna segment those so that compute doesn't overlap, that storage doesn't overlap. You're not storing your sensitive info in the same place you store your secret or your top secret information. In the enterprise, that might look a little different. You might not have a completely separate site. You might have like a separate folder on a network share, stuff for financials versus stuff for a business department. Um, last one is DLP. So that's data loss prevention. They actually make software out there that will like it's kind of like spyware basically to watch what you're typing, to watch what you put into websites. And it can tell if you're typing what looks like a credit card number into like an email draft. And it will say, hey, this user is saving credit card information somewhere they shouldn't be. Um, or they will they might watch the files you copy to a flash drive and say, hey, they just stole all of the, um, 
all the claim documents. Like we see claim numbers here going on this flash drive. That's what DLP software would do. It would be able to help identify like almost like a regex to say, this looks like a phone number. This looks like a social security number to be able to identify that. It searches all the data that's moving across your system, whether it's copy paste or anything like that. Um, last point is to log who's accessing what. This is really important if you have to go after a breach. If an employee in one department is going after files that they shouldn't be touching. Somebody in IT, say they go after all the payroll information and they want to see how much the CEO makes. That's stuff they shouldn't be looking at, but they probably have access to it because they're an admin in IT. So being able to log that and see who's looking at what is really important. All right, next domain, securing configuration. Um, so the first bullet point, that's talking about making sure you've got a process. When you've got a new computer and you configure it, what software do we put on it? Do we encrypt it? Um, how do we want to set up the Windows updates? Do we want it every week, every month? Um, that's that first point. The second point, same deal, but for your network hardware. So all your switches, your routers, your Wi-Fi access points, all the network gear that you have in an organization, that matters too. It might not be immediately obvious, but you might have just as much network gear as you have computer gear. And that's all gotta be set up and configured the same way a computer would. So making sure you're setting up your switch, you're connecting it to Microsoft AD, so all your network admins are logging in the same way. Um, making sure you've got the secure config for your network gear is important too. Um, third point, making sure your computer locks automatically. It's like if you walk away from your desk and you go use the bathroom, does your computer lock automatically? That's important. That's like so important. It seems like such a small thing. They put it in the CIS controls. Fourth point, setting up a firewall. Another basic obvious thing comes in Windows by default, um, making sure that thing's turned on. Some organizations, when they do their configuration, it might get turned off by accident. Making sure that's on is a big deal. Like you wouldn't think you would have to look for things like that. Things that are out of the box, security controls that come with Windows, you have to stay on top of that. Make sure it's still configured the way you think it's configured. Um, same deal for user devices. Windows has firewall on the laptop too. Um, managing enterprise assets and software. So, this would go back to, do you have a system, like a ticketing system for IT? Do you know all of, all of the uh, computers in your environment? Um, having a management system that keeps track of that securely for your, your physical assets and your software, your digital assets. Um, seventh point is keeping track of your default accounts. So whenever you install Windows for the first time, like it gives you administrator, that's like the basic user out of the box. Um, same deal on like every appliance ever, like ever buy a camera or Wi-Fi router from Best Buy, you log in, it's got a default admin login. So this is a big deal in the corporate world too, making sure we get software or hardware and set up that we're actually changing those passwords so that they're different. A lot of organizations, um, if there's a rush to get something set up quickly, or if somebody's not paying attention, it's really easy to just forget about that. And you've got something on the network now that you have to worry about. If anybody ever got on your network and found that thing, they have a way into it now. All right, so point eight, removing anything you don't need. So there's a lot of services in Windows. Um, really common one that's mentioned a lot in security blogs, uh, the print service. So that might be enabled by default in a Windows server. Um, there's some vulnerabilities, like the print spooler vulnerability, where you could send a document to it and Windows might try to interpret that to see how it should print it. And that service might just be enabled by default. And that server might not have anything to do with printing. Like this might be the web server for your organization. And Windows has this service enabled by default for printing. And it just comes with it. And if it's got this vulnerability, um, that's a potential way to get hacked. So taking all these services that might come out of the box and turning stuff off that you know isn't gonna be needed is super important. 
um, even if there's no vulns today, no vulnerabilities, that might save you from getting attacked in the future if there was to have a vulnerability discovered for that service. So point nine, um, setting up trusted DNS. So that's how, DNS is how your computer knows where to go when you type in go to google.com um, to be able to find the address and to be able to communicate to that website. And that's the DNS service. Um, so making sure you're using trusted DNS is important. The definition of trusted, that depends on your environment. Um, so you might point your, all your computers to a DNS server that you run as an enterprise. So if you're trying to go to a website that's just internal to your company that you don't want on the internet, it would ask your DNS server and it would say, oh yeah, go to the server over here down the hall and your computer would go there. Um, that's one way of doing trusted DNS. You can do this at home too. Um, another interpretation is encrypted DNS. So a lot of Android phones will do this by default, where when you go to google.com, it's encrypted so that your internet service provider that's letting you download google.com doesn't necessarily know that you are trying to go to that website. You can actually have the DNS request encrypted. That happens on Android by default. You can do it in Windows. If you go into the network settings, there's options for that. It's not by default in Windows, but you could set it up that way. Um, so this could be good depending on um, what you do or sites that you go to in like a high security environment. That's really important to prevent other companies from knowing what you're browsing. So if you're like in an engineering corporation and you're browsing certain sites that might give a competitor a tip off that you're looking at like a certain initiative or improving a certain product or process. And that knowledge could be very valuable to the competition. So like securing the web traffic, like just the site that you're going to, that could be a big deal. Um, point 10, uh, enforcing automatic device lockout. So that's kind of like if you've got a phone and you type the pin in so many times that you're locked out, you're done. You can't get into it anymore. Um, that's important for laptops too. Like if a laptop gets lost or forgotten in a coffee shop, somebody can't just go there all day just coming up with passwords to guess. Um, next point after that, it's a good idea. Say they guess wrong three times or five or 10 times. Um, make it self-destruct, delete the data on that laptop. Make it so that um, if the user, the person who found the laptop and was guessing at it, um, if they were really determined and they wanted to get the data off of there, um, make it self-destruct, delete the data. Next point after that is having a separate enterprise workspace. So if you use like Microsoft Outlook on your phone or Microsoft Teams, um, Android and, and iPhone, they'll actually make like a, like a sandbox. Like it'll actually separate all the app traffic there and encrypt it on the storage. So like if your phone was stolen, you might be able to see like your pictures and your text messages, but the stuff for your work is actually encrypted and stored separately. Um, so that happens automatically with, um, or it can happen automatically with, uh, with Microsoft. So fifth domain, account management is important. Um, making sure you're using different passwords. Don't use the same password everywhere. These are basic, basic steps. Um, keeping track of all the accounts that exist out there. Um, getting rid of accounts that have been left dormant for a while. So like if you've got an employee that leaves, delete their account. Don't let it stay active. You don't want that employee to be able to come back a year or two years later and be able to log in. And if they work in IT and they had access to a ton of stuff, that could be a huge secure risk. Um, restricting admin privileges to dedicated admin accounts. That's important because you don't want to be giving your super uh, critical access to different systems to normal user accounts. Like when you log into Windows and you're browsing the internet, 
you want that to be like a normal user account. So if you click on a link or you open an email or something and your computer gets hacked, then they take over that account and they start moving through the network. They're doing that as you, the everyday user. They don't automatically have full access to everything on your network. So giving those administrative privileges to like a separate account. So if you had like a Garth admin account, you put all the access on that, that's great because chances are I'm not browsing the web with the Garth admin account. I'm just browsing the web with the normal Garth account that I logged into my computer with. A lot more secure that way. Um, point five is similar to point one. Keep track of your accounts. Know all the service accounts out there. Things that might be running like background, jobs, tasks, any automation that runs in your environment as somebody, know what those accounts are. And a good way to centralize it would be using Active Directory or a tool like that. Um, point six, access control. So have a process, like a business process to give people access to things and to take their access away. So if somebody wants to get to a network share and see a certain folder, make sure there's like ticket or a workflow or at least their manager approves or something. You wanna have like a business process in place for that. Um, and maybe a good idea to like document all the people that you've given access to this thing. So if anything were to happen, um, we have an idea of who had access to what. Um, there's three points for MFA here. MFA is super critically important. So like if you're logging to your Chase Bank app and you don't get it immediately, it says type in this security code we sent to your phone. That's MFA. Um, that's important for everything. Um, so in the enterprise world, you might have that for an external app, um, like the Chase website, that's a good idea. Like for an external app, that's a good example of that. Um, remote access, like if you're somebody in IT and you wanna log into systems in the back end to do your job to, to work in IT, um, if you're work from home, it's really important that you have MFA so that if I'm working at my house and I try to log in, I have that same um, factor of authentication, that extra factor to know that it's really me and that my password didn't just get stolen and somebody else in the USA tried to log in with that password. Having MFA will stop your IT people from getting their accounts taken over and being used to log in from somewhere else. Um, same thing for admin access. Even if it's internal to your enterprise, assume you're compromised. Assume somebody is already in the network and trying to make it look like they're logging in from a computer that's on your network. You want that to use multi-factor too. So we're really absolutely certain that this person that's trying to log in to do something to a critical system, that that's actually that person in IT and not some Russian actor that compromised and is running from our computers internally. Point six, this might sound confusing, but in really, really large organizations, there's actually a need to keep track of all the ways that you could log into things. So as a student at Southeastern, a couple of things that come to mind you might have like the student housing portal that you log into. You've got your email, you've got your Leonet, you've got your Moodle. Um, that's like what, four or five systems. In a really large organization, you might have dozens or hundreds of systems that you log into. Um, like you might have to log into your badge system, the HVAC system, um, hundreds and hundreds of systems. And centralizing access control, um, that ties back to Microsoft Active Directory. Um, there's other tools out there that work the same way. Um, but that's a common way that you see in a lot of enterprises for centralizing that. Um, and one of the ways they do it is with uh, roles. So that's called RBAC. So we would say this guy in IT, he's got the database server admin role attached. and because he's in that group and he's got that role, um, he's automatically allowed to log into any database server. So using roles makes it a lot easier. The other way you would do this, if you weren't using roles, 
um, like an easy way if you're like just starting out in IT. You would just add that user as like an admin in Windows. A lot of companies or smaller businesses, they might start that way. And that creates a lot of technical debt because now you've got these accounts everywhere, all over the business. Um, say Joe started in IT and then he wanted to go move in the financial um, department. He still got all of his access for all the IT things, even though he moved departments because um, if role-based access control wasn't in use, we couldn't just look at that person and say, what does he have access to? You've actually got to go to every single computer and look in the admin group in every single Windows box and say, okay, who's on this server? Who's on this server? Um, so using roles makes it a lot easier to keep track of who gets access to what. So point seven is vulnerability management. So from a big picture, that's making sure you patch and stay up to date. Uh, you want to have a business process around that. Um, there might be a lot of systems more than just like updating windows. You might have to update your um, HVAC system. Like there might be a web portal to log into your HVAC system that might use like an older version of some Python library that's got a vulnerability in it. That means that anybody on the network can get root access to that system and use it as a foothold to do other stuff in your enterprise. So vulnerability management applies to anything electronic in your organization. There has to be a process. Um, and there should be a process for fixing that too. So when you read the news and you see some new vulnerability that came out, um, knowing what to do to actually fix that is important. So you might have a couple different groups in IT um, that might be responsible for different things, like your help desk might be responsible for the laptops and your server team might be responsible for your database patching, and things like that, knowing who needs to do what. Um, and automating this wherever possible will help you. So getting your automatic Windows updates, your apps, um, making sure you use tools to scan those. Um, they actually sell enterprise software. It's really expensive, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it will go out to every computer on your network and it will look and say, okay, this is this version of Windows. And I know that that version of Windows has these vulnerabilities. And we know that this is super critical because that vulnerability was ranked such and such score. Um, there's a CVSS score to rank vulnerabilities. If something's like a score of 10, that's generally bad news. So that means somebody could exploit that vulnerability and gain access and gain control over that system. So they actually have systems that will scan for loans throughout your entire enterprise and say, oh yeah, these database servers, they're secure, but this badge system, they've got these problems with it that an attacker could get in from. So having a, having a tool to scan for that's important. Um, Automating that, say every month or every week, you're doing a scan, looking at everything. That's important too. And the last one, this seems like a stupid bullet point, fixing the volumes, patching your things. That's a, that is a process in an enterprise. You might have business applications that are depending on a certain version of Windows. Like you might have, um, say for instance, uh, Leonet depends on like a really old version of Windows. It doesn't, but say, suppose it did. Um, if that was critical to the enterprise, you might not necessarily be able to upgrade that version of Windows first. You might have to go to whoever sold you that software and say, hey, um, this looks outdated. I need to upgrade. How do we do that? And you might have to stand up a whole brand new server farm and a bunch of new systems to put the new software in place to be able to get to that newer version of Windows because their software only ran on like the server equivalent of Windows XP. This stuff is out there. It's, it's more common than you might think in an enterprise. And it can be really, really troublesome to stay up to date. Um, it can be very frequent that some organizations, they might have a version of Windows that's a decade old and they might be stuck on that because of a lot of reasons. It can be a process to fix vulnerabilities. It's not obvious, like you can't just patch your Windows system. Like there's a whole, there's a whole uh, bunch of reasons why that might not be an easy thing. Um, 
Point eight is on logs. So having a log management process. So whenever I got that new network gear, those new Windows laptops, knowing what logs we want off of those systems is important. So you might have somebody that all they do all day is security and they pick out all the kinds of logs that would be important. So say login logs of who's logging in, logs of um, maybe I'm running PowerShell or Python, just running commands on the system. Maybe I want to take every command that's typed into that computer, like from a script process wise, and store that in a log system somewhere. Um, just in case, say that box was compromised, somebody hacked it, and they use like a Python program to uh, wreck the organization. And now you've got logs of exactly what code was running. Um, so having a process, knowing what logs you want, collecting those logs, um, that's important. Uh, third point is making sure you can store that. That can be a lot of data, depending on what you're getting. Like if you're collecting all the Windows logs, like if you go into Windows Event Viewer and you scroll as far back as you possibly can, like on a laptop, that might be like a month of logs. Um, some organizations, they might be legally required to keep like seven years of logs. So you have to like store that and that can be terabytes and terabytes of data per day, like several terabytes of logs. And that can build up over time. Like you might have an organization, seven years of logs, that's like a petabyte of data somewhere. Like that's not easy. You can't just throw that on a Google drive. You can't just throw that on a server. Like you might need like a whole section of your data center just to store the logs for security. So that's, that's a whole point. Um, time synchronization. Uh, this comes into play a lot if you've been hacked and you try to figure out, put the pieces together of what happened. So if somebody hacked your web server and then they moved to your database servers and they stole all your data and they sent it to Russia, um, knowing that that happened and that order is important because uh, it helps you identify what, what actually happened. Like It's like crime scene investigation almost. Um, knowing that they went from A to B and they didn't actually compromise your database and then go to your web server. Um, getting your time synchronized is important. So like a Windows laptop is synchronized by default. Like it goes to, I think like time.mist.gov. So all your home computers are going to be in sync. But in the enterprise, that's different. The enterprise might have its very own time server and in some enterprises, not everything might be pointed to that. Like you might have your laptops and your servers pointed to that, but your badge system might be going to time.nist.gov. And if your organization is like a couple seconds off, that's a lot of time for a computer. You can get a script to do a ton of stuff in a couple of seconds. So making sure that your time is really accurate is critically important. Um, there could be say, you're trying to get your laptop to point to your time server um, and everybody switches to working from home. They take their computer home. Now they can't talk to that time server because you're not in the corporate network. And so you have no time synchronization. And if it's a couple of weeks or a couple of months in between the next time they go into the office, um, that laptop might be 20 or 30 minutes out of sync. Um, so that could be really, really difficult to put the pieces together for like the crime scene investigation of what happened. Um, so these next points, making sure you have detailed logs, making sure you get the details that you want out of it, not just somebody logged in, who logged in, what's their username, did they log in from home, what's their IP address? Like these are some information pieces that we would know. Um, making sure that's actually put in the log is a whole nother thing. Um, like you might have, like when you run a Python uh, program, you've got like the console output. Well, if you turn on like a higher level of debug, like you might get a ton more logs. That might be too much logs. Don't log everything. You don't want petabytes of logs, but you want just the right amount of logs so that we're getting all the good bits that we could go and investigate an incident after the fact. And these last two points are like web traffic logs. So if somebody, um, downloads a script off of GitHub. We want to know that they went to GitHub to do that. Um, if somebody's going to like Facebook all day, that's important too, collecting those logs.
more ideas. So command line logs, all the PowerShell commands you're running, that's important. Um, keeping all the logs in a central place. So by default, like Windows Event Viewer, that's on all Windows computers. That's on that computer though. Like if a hacker got in and they used a server to do something and they blew up the server to cover their tracks, those logs are gone. Like you're not getting those back. So centralizing those logs, like putting them to a, a separate system, keeping them there, that's, that's going to save you. Um, point 10, you might have to keep the logs for a couple years, depending on what industry you work in. Um, good idea to see what's in the logs every now and then to make sure you're still getting all the bits of info. So like if you're getting website logs and keeping track of who's logging in from what, maybe a new web server admin got hired in your organization. Maybe they set up a bunch of new web servers and they're not using the same log settings that you agreed with, with that team that you should be using. So now you've got all the old servers are logging the way you want, but none of the new servers are logging the way you want. So if those servers were to get hacked, you would have no idea where the user logged in from. So logging uh, reviews, like going through and looking at the data, is critically important to make sure you've got the bits that you want. All right, point nine, so email and browser. So using a browser that's up to date, that's point one, super obvious. Um, using website filtering services, uh, back when I was a student, they had a service that if you went to like a really sketchy site or a site that had malware, um, it would not let you, it wouldn't let you go to that. Um, and it did that by looking at the DNS name of that website. So if you went to like superbadmalware.com, you wouldn't be able to go there. So that's important in enterprise. Um, point three, getting URL filters, similar to point two, but this gives you a little bit more granularity. So say we wanted to let them go to the business version of Dropbox. We could use a URL filter to allow that. Um, like if they went to dropbox.com slash business, that's allowed, but dropbox.com slash like my personal Dropbox, not allowed. Um, so that's important to make sure that your user is sending data to like your corporate Dropbox account and they're not just stealing all your stuff and putting it in their Dropbox account. Um, point four, restricting your browser extensions. Who's had a grandma that has had like a dozen different toolbars and extensions and buttons installed, like restricting that, locking that down, that's important in the enterprise. You don't just want somebody in financials to be able to install everything in the world. That, that could get you a virus. Um, point five is DMARC. That is, um, that's an email security protection that basically says who's allowed to send mail on behalf of you. Um, so you might get like a newsletter from uh, your university and <clears throat> there might be a lot of departments that send out their own mail and there might be a lot of different places that mail might come from, like the mail might come from campus. The mail might come from uh, a different website that the university owns to send mail. Um, the university might contract with um, a third party to do like reviews and things like that. You might get mail from there too. And it might all look like it's coming from the, the same corporation or university or organization. Um, but DMARC basically says who's allowed to send mail on behalf of your company. Um, so that if somebody out in Russia stands up a server and tries to send out an email and make it look like it's coming from your business, um, getting that to flag as spam in Google to say, hey, this looks suspicious. It's the guy said he was sending an email based off of chase.com, but he doesn't run a chase.com web server. That's what DMARC is that allows you to get that little notification in your mail client to say this email doesn't look right. Um, so you have to set this up as a business. If you don't have DMARC set up, it can be ambiguous. Um, Gmail might still be able to detect and say, this looks suspicious, um, but it might not. Um, so your, your user or your student um, might get an email 
And if the business wasn't using DMARC, there's a possibility that might get through and somebody in Russia or China could have sent that email. So making sure you get DMARC set up is pretty important. Um, blocking files, like don't let your users open an email that's got an exe attached. Say, hey, look at this invoice. And it's not like invoice.pdf, it's invoice.exe and they just ran a virus. Blocking like exes in email, that's a very common thing. Um, and having a having a system that scans it for malware, that's also important. I want to pause here and move to five to see if anyone has any questions that anyone needs to see. I don't want them to walk out if they had questions and didn't have a chance to ask. Are we going to have the ACM? No ACM these days. Go game jam or try it. Um, uh, yeah, question. Uh, slide seven. Yeah. Vulnerability management. What do you mean by process? Okay. So the remediation process, that's your process of fixing the vulnerability. So if you've got a web server and that's running say like microsoft is um and there's a vulnerability out tomorrow um we want to have like an agreed upon process of when that's going to get updated so um if it's super super critical and it's a really bad vulnerability that somebody on china could just hack the site like right now and get complete access over the computer like we might agree and say Hey, this vulnerability, if it's got a CVSS score of say eight or higher, that's real bad. And we want to patch it in like an hour, like right now, you can bring down the business to patch this server, like bring down the chase.com website, even during the middle of the business day, because this vulnerability is so super important to patch that like the whole corporation could get home. Like um, you would have like an agreed upon process where if it's like, just like normal, security updates and it's like less severe vulnerabilities say it's like a cvss score of like three or four um those are important too but typically like you'd have to chain them together with like as an attacker to be able to do bad stuff so those aren't as critical to patch like that might be able to wait till after hours or till say we patch on the first tuesday of every month like it could wait till then if it's like a lower vulnerability score so having that process to say when we're going to patch and how severe it has to be to like patch sooner like that has to be agreed upon because you don't just want to have your security department say hey we saw this in the news um and there's a new version updated chrome and it's like only a minor security problem we don't want to have to waste a ton of time taking all the effort to shift into bringing down everything in the corporation and interrupting everybody if it's like not an issue Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to shift just a little bit away. Something that you mentioned early on, or that you showed early on, you had a lot of certifications. So would you say with those, mm -hmm. and one of the questions that I get asked often is where I'm going with this, your uh, education and your certifications, did you find that you were getting certifications because your employer was asking you to do that to continue or because that, that's what you wanted to do? Or was that a way to get you in the door for other employers? Uh, that third one, really big, getting my foot in the door for employers. Um, when somebody goes to LinkedIn and they see you have like 30 different certifications, they love that. They're like, oh yeah, let's hire this guy. Like, he, he, he seems to know what he's doing. Like that's like the equivalent of having like 10 degrees, like having 10 certifications. That's huge. That looks like, you know what you're talking about. Uh, it's a really easy way to get past the HR filter. If you're trying to get hired, um, somewhere in it, um, the, I think the first question you asked was, is that something that's required? Oftentimes? No. That's just like an extra step of saying, yeah, I really wanted to go and get the master's degree and the PhD and these other certs. Um, it shows that you've got like really strong work ethic. Um, so it's a way to set you apart from other people, like having those extra certs. Um, 
most of the time they don't require those in a lot of jobs. They might require like a basic cert, like a really easy to get cert and like that's it. Um, but if you've got like the one that's like a next tier higher than that and somebody else applied and they only have the basic cert, like you're gonna get hired before they would. Um, and what was, what was the third question? No, that covers it. That covers it? Okay. Yeah, that covers it. Yeah. Any, other, any other questions? Yeah. Super vague question. I know it has a lot to do with the circumstances of what the project you're looking at. But I was curious to know you, you mentioned in the GitHub repositories that if people will clone repositories and then ask the malicious code potentially. Yeah. Is there a certain pattern where you'll see that malicious code? Or is it key or so certain threat actors will develop a pattern, like fingerprint, if you will. Like um, some state group in China, they might get lazy and they may start cloning out these repositories of code on GitHub. And their thing is they just add pi to the end of it, and that's it. Like you can say, oh yeah, because it's got pi. It might be this bad threat actor, um, or if it's got this bit of malicious code in it that tries to steal your AWS API creds. Like we know that was this like Russian group that was trying to do that a couple months back. There's it, it depends like what they might try to do that would tip you off of who's doing it. Um, it's not immediately obvious. It it can be really difficult. Um, make sure when you're typing in like the library and you're doing like an npm install or installing a Python package that like you're not typing the letters like one out of order or typing something in with an extra word at the end of it. Um, and like there, there can be cases where you might find tutorials online. It's really common. Everybody actually using the malicious version of the package and the original one that's being maintained, it's synced automatically. So it's, it can be hard to tell. Um, there's been cases where like thousands of applications might use like the wrong version of a package. And um, the, a lot of stuff could get stolen that way. That's, uh, that's a prevalent risk as like a software developer. Um, any, any other questions? I'll try to run through these like really quick. Like, I'll, I'll try to like knock these out like one minute each. But um, let's see. Point two. Uh, point two is just making sure like Windows Defender updates automatically, getting those signature updates. Point three um, is saying like when you plug a flash drive in, make sure stuff just doesn't run automatically. and just making sure your malware is working automatically in the background. Um, point seven is cool. So in the enterprise, you can actually buy software that might cost several hundred thousands of dollars that'll do behavior monitoring. So we actually do machine analytics, or you could do machine analytics on um, activity that's happening. So say somebody badges in every day at eight o'clock and they badge out at five. If somebody badges in at 2 a.m., that's an anomaly. There's software out there that you can buy that will look for those kinds of patterns automatically from your log data that you're already collecting to try to spot um, some things to help you investigate. So you don't have to look at all the logs. It'll bubble up the alerts that matter for the rare things that you should look at. Um, and this could get really, really advanced. Um, like you might have a whole compute cluster just to look for patterns in the data. Um, it might do something as fancy as saying, well, we've got developers at our organization. They work in this department. Um, and this user that works in finance, who's not a developer, went to GitHub. Going to GitHub is not a problem. If you're in finance and you're going to GitHub, that's suspicious. Like if you're really, really on top of things, that might be enough to lock out that user account to say, why are you going to GitHub? Like, we want to make sure like your password didn't just get stolen and somebody was in the organization trying to download a script to like compromise more computers. Like 
certain things that might seem um, simple um, in a really mature organization, there might be automatic safeguards in place to take action, lock computers, lock stuff out, um, depending on the behavior analytics. Um, but this usually isn't in like small businesses because the software to do that costs a lot of money and you have to have a huge cluster to run it on. Um, so that's normally like the bigger or better funded organizations that would have something like that. Um, point 11, uh, data recovery. So like from a student perspective, keeping the backup of your paper that you're working on, that's important, right? Well, same thing applies in an organization. If you've got a web server running on a server and it's hosted at the university and say a huge hurricane comes through and floods the building that has the server, the university website might go down. Um, so having a data re recovery process in place to say, hey, we'll have a backup server over in a different city, or maybe we'll copy all the data every night, put it somewhere else for safekeeping. Having a process there is super, super important as an enterprise. Um, and protecting that, uh, making sure that you're encrypting the backups, that they're stored securely, um, and testing that is important too. So like you might have an automatic backup at home running um, and every night it's supposed to take a backup. Well, what if the network cable got unplugged from your NAS that you're backing up to? And it's not obvious to you that the backup stopped, but then your laptop fails and you go back to say, okay, let me go get that paper that I was working on last week. And it's not there because your backups haven't been happening. Um, testing your data recovery process and going in every once in a while and seeing, all right, is the data there? Okay, good. Can I actually restore this server, this web server, this database server, something that's got all of my critical um, student records or bank records, um, making sure that actually works when we try to turn on Windows and see if the application loads. Testing it is super important. You might run into um, some issues where certain databases have to be shut down in a certain way in order to make a backup that works. Um, some backup solutions, they take it at an exact point in time. So when you boot up Windows, it looks like you ripped the power cable out of your computer, like it didn't shut down cleanly. So you might have some database records that are corrupt, like the very most recent last few database records just might not be there. And if you're a bank and you're doing thousands of transactions a second, like that's a lot of data that just got lost because the data recovery process wasn't tested and nobody found this out. So actually like going in there and seeing if it works is a huge thing. Okay, uh, network infrastructure. So this is making sure all your switches are up to date. Um, like all your network, firewalls, routers, Wi-Fi routers, things like that. Um, making sure you're following best practices. Um, point four is important having diagrams, documentation. Like I can tell you working in a lot of different IT jobs, like going from one job to the next, the organizations that had really good documentation, it made my job a lot easier to figure out, okay, how does this server connect over here? Like somebody's like, oh yeah, here's the PDF. Here's how the network works. I love having documentation because I don't have to guess. I don't have to go do like a mystery hunt to figure out, all right, so this server goes through this firewall that goes through this VPN to this other like sub enterprise that we also own that's over somewhere else on the other side of the world. Like you don't have to do a wild goose chase. So documentation is huge. Not every organization uh, does a really good job of it. Um, so point five, if you study for some security certifications, you might see the AAA mentioned a couple times. So that is, that's an acronym that stands for authentication, authorization, and auditing. So the authentication part might be, I logged in, I'm Garth. Um, and I logged in and it knows that I'm Garth and I can prove it. And the server agrees that that's me, that's authentication. Authorization is saying, well, he's Garth and Garth works in IT and he's got these roles. He's got these RBAT groups. 
assign to him. He's got the the group that lets him administer database servers. Um, that's the authorization part that actually lets me into the switch. Um, like if you try to log into a site um, and you're a user, not an administrator, like you might see something totally different. And the, the auditing part is where you're actually logging all that to see who's logging in, who's, who's trying to gain access to your server. Let's see. <clears throat> Point eight, making sure you have a dedicated computer for admin work. Um, in a secure environment, that's important. So if you have um, like a very privileged account that can log into every server in your entire organization, you might not want to do that from your laptop that you use every day to check your mail. Um, so having your Garth admin account separate from your Garth everyday user account is good, but also having an entirely separate like computer that you only ever use your Garth admin account on that computer. That's good too, because in your normal day to day, like you might be downloading a lot of PDFs, you might be running a lot of programs, you're doing a lot of things uh, that could be inherently risky. Like you might have a virus or malware that you don't even know about. Um, like I said, the the average time to detect for an organization is like more than half a year. So you may have been compromised six months ago and have no idea. Um, but if you have a separate computer that you're using all of your sensitive um, accounts on, that can save you sometimes. All right, so for network monitoring, um, 13.1, centralizing the alerting, similar to centralizing the logging. Um, typically in a large environment, you will have like somewhere where you send all your logs to, um, and then you might have some security server running and looking at the logs to see, okay, if somebody logs into a database server and then runs the command to like delete all the databases, like if they do those two things, send me an alert. Um, having a centralized system that's looking at all the logs, that's important. Um, you don't just want to set those alerts up on the servers themselves because if somebody got in and compromised that system, um, they could tamper with that alert. They could destroy the alert. Uh, they could delete the log. So sending the logs somewhere else and doing the alerting somewhere else is important. Um, so there's there's uh, four other acronyms: the HIDS and the HIPS. That's your host intrusion detection system or the prevention system for HIPS. So. That is basically Windows Defender. That is your HIPS. That's detecting if your host, your laptop, got compromised, got a virus. Um, the reason they distinguish, um, sometimes you might have a system that detects, but doesn't necessarily stop you. So this would be in an organization where availability is really important. Say you're at a doctor's office and they've got some antivirus software say that that doctor that's using that computer, it's life or death, whether they're able to use the software on that computer. Like it's critically important that that's available and doesn't get locked. You might have an instance where you might choose a HIDS where you just detect it and send a security guy an alert, say, hey, this looks sketchy, but we didn't stop it because we didn't want somebody to die. Um, whereas somewhere in the DOD, you, where it's not life or death, uh, where security, and confidentiality is more important than availability. You might say anything sketchy at all, uh, even in the slightest, let's block it. We would rather get the alert than to get all of our data leaked. Um, depending on your organization, confidentiality might be more important than availability or vice versa. So that's why you might choose to detect and not stop something. Um, so for the NIDs and the NIPs, that's the same deal, but for the network, so you can do your URL detection, your domains that you're allowed to go to. Um, an organization with a network IPS system, a DIPS, it might block certain websites. Um, but for sort, certain users, like uh, so you've got board members or C-level executives, you don't necessarily want to block stuff that they do. Like, we don't want our people in the call center, um, if you're like 
um, for an organization. You don't want them, we don't want them to go to Spotify, um, but if our C-levels want to do that, we don't like it and we definitely want to detect on it um, so that we can educate them not to do that from their computer, but we don't necessarily want to block them out, right? Um, some organizations, they might want to have uh, a more smooth experience for people higher up in the chain. Um, so you might find that there is a detective approach used instead of a preventative approach outright. Uh, a lot of places might do that. It depends on the industry, depends on the criticality of the data. Um, let's see. So point four, filtering traffic between networks. So if you've got like a network in a library that anybody can just walk in off the street and get on the Wi-Fi, we don't want those users to be able to talk to the system that manages like badges. Um, so separating those networks is important. So doing traffic filtering to say, this network, it can go to the internet because it's in the library, but it can't talk to the servers. It can't go after other stuff. That saves you so that somebody off the street who goes into your lobby, they can't just go hack your entire organization. So that's point four. That's basically just firewall rules. Um, Point six, similar to the DNS and the URL logs of what sites you're going to, getting your network traffic flow recorded. Um, that can save you uh, internally, even like not just websites are going to outside, but um, that could help you piece together if one server got hacked and then we saw this exe file was transferred to another system. Um, getting those logs internally is important too. So do we have any other 